Oh, sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, wait, wait a second. Mick, what's going on? What? You got a problem? Yeah, I bet, mate. It's called the tax man. No, you silly bugger. I'm going to have to burn me paddocks before seeding. How come? What's going on, Mick? Well, before you start talking about clouds of stupidity because I've got to burn, my bloody air seeder won't get through it. Crikey, Mick, we've certainly got a problem here. Hey, tell you what, Mick, I've got mum in the car and you're on loudspeaker, so we better be quick. Look, if it's not the paddock's problem, and it's not the air seeder's problem, I reckon we've got a problem, Mick. So when you work it out, you give me a ring back. All right, catch you, Mick, see ya. Mick, not again. What's going on, mate? You cunning little bugger. Me a cunning little bugger, Mick. How's that work out? Never thought of that before. It's me bloody management, mate. Oh, come on, Mick. You're being a bit hard on yourself, really. Well, it is management when you think about it, Mick. But I reckon with regenerative agriculture, it's actually a bit of the thought process that goes with it. The thought process? Crikey, never thought of it that way. So you reckon it's management and thought process? Yeah, Mick, I reckon it might be the thought process that will change the management. Anyway, Mick, when I get home, I'll come out and we'll blow a couple of froths off and um, by midnight we'll be talking braille and we'll come up with something. All right, mate, we'll catch you later. <laughs> Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Valentine's Day for Regenerative Earth Agriculture. Fantastic crowd, Rochelle, Justin, Graham, Lynn, fantastic hosts, wonderful to be here, great audience. That's a quick question because, you know, after lunch, you always know you got the bloody drag shift because it's going to be a pretty big effort keeping all you buggers away. <laughs> <laughs> so, before we start, a bit, bit of exercise and it'd be like, and it goes a bit like this. So, if you thought it was management, can you put your hand up? If you thought it was a thought process and the management to go together, put your hand up. Yeah. Because regenerative agriculture is about the thought process. The change in the thought process that will change your management. Today we're talking about the soil sponge and watershed and saving those 95 raindrops. Now, I live a fair bit of my time underground with all my mates, all my microbial mates. Um, it's um, been a fantastic journey. I've had some wonderful support and wonderful friends out of this with Christine Jones, a personal friend, and Charlie Massey, uh, Walter Yana, um, Cole Sice, who I call the old bush ranger, because <laughs> if you met Cole, I reckon he is a bush ranger. And um, yeah, it's been a great journey. But with regenerative agriculture, it's not difficult. And as you saw with um, Andre this morning, it sounds technical, but it's not. And what we're going to do today is we're just going to wander through a few issues, uh, not issues, it's definitely not issues. Um, firstly, I'd like to say thank you to Tom and Colin Briggs, to um, David, um, Uh, um, I know his name starts with A. <laughs> and A? Eh? Alistair. Alistair and Tim. Tim, yeah, uh, Austin's from out there. Um, because to come over to um, come over here to New South, uh, yeah, no, I'm on the wrong side of the Jolly Creek, aren't I? <laughs> get, the, get, get, the, <laughs> get a bit confused, but that's okay. But you know, in the Great Gunwana land, there was no such thing as Victoria and New South Wales. And within, within that Great Gunwana land, um, there was a challenge yesterday, and I thought it was quite fascinating, and I thought it was brilliant, actually, because this guy said to me, but I live 150 kilometres over there. And I said, well, where's over there? And he said, oh, just up along the Murray and over there in New South Wales. And I said, well, that's what I said to him. I said, you know, there's only the white fella that said it's New South Wales and Victoria. 
it is actually Gondwana land. And Gondwana land has got some great opportunities, but it's also got some challenges for you, especially as white settlers. And um, it is not difficult. Regenerative agriculture is a bit like um, looking at how nature works. Go into the bush and where it's been light, just left alone, you walk in there and it feels nice and soft. You feel it walking on the carpet, springing back up. It's cooler, it smells nice. And that's all we've got to do. So, okay. Right, who's keen on putting all their farms back to trees? Ah, bugger. No one. Oh, I got one. <laughs> no, we're not suggesting that at all. What we're going to do is we're going to mimic nature. And I'm going to go through the process today. And very fortunate that um, out at David and the boys' farms and at Cole and Tom's that we did find some stuff and we run them under the microscopes. Now, just briefly, I'm a microscopic uh, photographer and also an analyst. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting world. Uh, some, of the world some of the stuff's been presented in the United Nations um, at the General Assembly in 2017. Um, yeah, it's a big deal, but look, let's build a bridge and get over that because that's past, isn't it? Okay, all right, so we're just going to um, start and this is a bit cheeky, and you always realised I'm a bit cheeky anyway, so let's enjoy ourselves. It's a brand new day. You know, it is. It's a brand new day when it comes to regenerative agriculture. Uh, it's a brand new day because when we look at it, um, Valentine's Day, we've hijacked it, along with um, Rochelle and, and um, Graham and the family support at Nutrisoil, uh, been quite involved with um, this day with um, Helen and her family and Kelly. So it is a brand new day and it's soil sponge and water shedding. What's it mean? Now and Andre actually pinched a bit of my um, fun, but you've got a soil sponge, right? And we want to save 95 raindrops and how do we do it? Well, Mother Nature doesn't quite easily, but we don't as broadacre farmers and farmers, because we've actually collapsed our soil. We've burnt the carbon from our soil. We've oxidised it. You walk on it, it's like walking on this hard as a brick. So the watershedding is the issue. So how do we actually start creating the watershed, the soil sponge? Now the soil sponge, what we've gone is we've gone away from, and this is with Christine and myself and Walter, we've gone away from carbon sequence station because I'm going to pull the living daylights out of you. And you are all going to go to sleep, and I don't want that. So with the soil sponge, it is the soil sponge, it's how we go about it. So we're just going to pop into this next slide and we'll have a look. So what you're looking at there under a dissecting microscope at, at around about 250 meg, um, see those little white strands and see how wet it looks? And see the amber liquid. Any of you guys, people been to Christine Jones's? Um, anyone been to Christine jo Jones's shows? Okay. Remember how Christine talks about the the amber liquid in the soil. There's your amber liquid, and it's the soil glue. These little fibres are gluing the soil together, but it's aeration. This soil has less bulk density than the compacted soil by far. So what happens, we're go, I'm just going to pop over to this one and it's, I won't read this out or would you like me to read this out? I probably will then. Okay, soil aggregation is soil aeration. If you haven't got soil aeration, it's a bit like us. You cut the oxygen off, we won't live. So if we have compact soil, you have no root depth. You haven't got a rooting depth. So it, in as many words, more airspace means higher aggregation, higher organic matter, higher, wa higher water holding capacity, longevity of green growth. You don't hear that very often, but it is the longevity of green growth. The high biological activity will show you that. The soil has the ability to breathe, which encourages roots to in penetrate deeper into the profile. In return, building deeper, healthier root biomass creates higher soil aggregation and healthier balanced biology. Now you saw Andre's photo uh, slide today where you had those roots going into that, hanging off those pots. And that's exactly what happens, is if 
in that process of the thought of change to change that management, this is the way it does and it doesn't take a lot. We're looking at, um, uh, this was, I do apologise people, this is in Western Australia, this is up at uh, Mullerin where we had the round table conference in October. October. 120 people. I drove 864 kilometres from Albany to Mullerin just to pop up and say good day to Diane and Ian and the, the, um, <coughs> with um, Rochelle and Nutrisoil, Christine and Cole. We did a full day there. It was fantastic fun. I don't know if you can all see that slide clearly, but on the right hand side, it's saying sitting in extreme dry ground for four weeks, eight mils of rain, 36 hours after, that seedling was coated with five litres of um, Nutrisoil liquid. The neighbour's paddock, 24 hours after, uh, 24 hours after 60 hours post rain, it's not even halfway there. These, when, you, when you're looking at biologically um, putting plants in the soil, what you're going to find is it's going to be very difficult for you to start with because what's going to happen is, crikey, that plant's only that tall, but all the work's happening underground. And that's where you need to have your shovels. You dig down and this plant will have a root mass. At two leaf stage, this plant has got a root mass that'll choke a cat. I mean, I shouldn't say that. Um, but yeah, it, it's pretty big. <laughs> so. What I'm saying is this plant has actually got itself together and it's having some fun. You know, it's, get, it's a been, with, with a biostimulant like um, worm juice, the, the seedling germinates and the coleoptile and the little roots germinate. And what actually happens is this seedling thinks, wow, I'm growing in this mega fauna. I've got this wonderful paradise. And all of a sudden it get, really gets its gear together. And by the time it wakes up, it's um, a little bit fooled, it's too late. She's putting heaps of exudations into the soil. These, root do, re, these roots are going down 1.2 metres. Um, we had a hole and we dug down and, and it, no, we stopped at 1.2 metres. And this was in um, Mullerin, pretty dry year. Um, it's no different to here, no different worldwide. The soil is a soil, it's a medium, it's got to be fed. If you have brown soil, if you can see the soil, you have sad soil. You have no soil armour and you'll understand this by the time we've finished. Well, hopefully that I can clearly demonstrate why soil armour and photosynthesis and the longevity of green growth is critically important for your soils, but not just for your soils, for your animals, our human health, and most importantly, our globe. Sorry. We're actually in the shit. And let's cut the chase. The United Nations are stating we have 60 harvests left. The English have come out and said we've got 100 if we don't change. Well, I've got grandkids. And I want to see them have a good life. And it's up to us to get our shit together and get on with it. And with our help, we can, because I do want my grandkids to have a chance. It's my right. Okay? Right, enough in this looky shit and we'll get on with it. Okay, on the left side here, it, it's truly, so, this is so easy. On the right side of, on the left side of the screen, we have conventional farming, exactly like Andre uh, was talking about. We have no, we have no biology we have no aggregation. This plant, and I'll briefly go through this, the difference between these two plants is that this plant here on my left side is actually growing in solution. By meaning of that, the, the plant, the growing in solution, and when I say this, I am definitely not calling anybody morons, okay? This plant is growing in solution, so as the solution runs out, we have to put more on if it's either nutrition or it's moisture, we've got to put more on. This plant has got no defence mechanism whatsoever. It's got a, it's open to every pathogen possible known to man because it has not got any defence mechanism. So we've got to babysit this plant. 
to get it through to maturity. It will survive, and we do it quite regularly. We, and we get and it has been fantastic. You know, um, I'll, I'll come back to that one in a minute, but on the right-hand side, we have got a plant living in a biological way. And that plant is actually surviving and the king to the jungle. And you guys have been and heard Christine, you will know exactly what I'm talking about when I say the king of the jungle is mycorrhizal fungi. 95% of plants on this planet communicate to each other through mycorrhizal fungi. These guys do not have to live in solution. By all means, they do take stuff out of solution. But most of this plant's nutritional value comes from the mycorrhizal fungi. The mycorrhizal fungi actually, when the, when the plant germinates or if the plant's um, close to a mycorrhizal spore, the mycorrhizal spore sh sends out a signal to the plant, turn your um, defence me mechanism off. I want to enter. Now, if we have that plant full of nitrates and we have high phosphorus levels, that plant's going to say no. It's as simple as that. Mycorrhizal fungi will not associate to it. No way. But if things are basically okay, and I'm certainly not saying go cold turkey because you're going to get into trouble. Drop your phosphates down, drop your nitrates, uh, nitrogens down and just go into it gently. This plant on the right has got full control. The mycorrhizal fungi has full control of that plant's health, well-being and cycling. That plant is talking to the next door neighbour plant, then I'm talking to you, then I'm talking to you, and we're sharing what we don't want. But we're also sharing intellectual knowledge. Just a question. How many people have got livestock? Please, put your hand up. Have you noticed that when you put your sheep in, or animals into a paddock, if the wind's blowing into their face, they would always prefer to graze into the wind? Yes? Yeah. Do you know why? Okay, I'll tell you why. The great wildebeest do it. The, the caribou do it. The bison do it. They all graze into the wind. And one reason is because of these guys, mycorrhizal fungi. Because if they were grazing with the wind behind them, this signal would be sent up front and that would be too uh, impalatable to eat. Why do the wildebeest and the caribou and the, the migratory animals keep going? Because I've been eating the grass, the grass has been said, right, hang on, we're under attack, sends up these enzymes, it makes it bitter and horrible, and the animal moves on. And that's how the plains, like, like Andrew, Andre said, they harvest it down, then they let it go, the root system drops off to that depth, then it kicks back up, and what have we just done? We've just added this huge amount of biomass back into that soil for these plants to grow in. I don't need calcium. I don't need lime, I don't need phosphorus, I don't need anything that man can put on me. I don't want it. I don't. You know, the last time, it's a funny thing, um, been over here since, what, since Saturday, Rochelle, and, you know, I haven't seen any road trains run into the bush or anything to um, put out lime or gypsum or phosphorus or whatever you want to put on it. It... Nature is purely beautiful in how it rotates and, and organises itself. And like with um, Andre and, and Cole Sice and all those guys, uh, Christine, we have absolutely gone beyond reasonable doubt. We have the proof that as we increase the soil microbiology, we actually increase phosphorus, potassium, um, the, um, oh, look, the whole lot, nitrogen, the cation exchange, we don't need to do anything. But how do we do it? The next slide of size, uh, um, we're coming up. Oh, yeah, yeah, this is at Briggs Farm, just go back one. This slide on the right hand side was taken in Western Australia. This next slide was taken two days ago from the Briggs Farm. And notice the fibres running through there. You still got the aggregation, you still got the air spaces. Okay? You've still got the aggregation, you've still got the air spaces. This soil was very, very dry. Obviously, you know, probably it hasn't been that warm not, uh, through January here, was it? Was it very warm or not? No, no. They reckon you wouldn't even wake up to get thirst to have a beer. A oh, crikey. What, was it 45, 46 sometimes? <laughs> For about 14, 15 days. So it, um, it put a lot of pressure on things, you know, and it really has. 
But to see how the, the, the grass is as five and how they will come back is quite, quite wonderful and quite staggering. Now, I'm going to let you people in the next set of brackets work this out for me. On the right hand side, the, the petrometer is going at around about 150 and then to 250 maybe in um, soil pressure. That's in the plant. Away from the plant, we have, we're just about up to the point where on the subsoil, we're just about to the point where a roof will not grow through. And that is at about 25 millimeters, uh, 25 centimeters, about that deep. Can't get there. Soil pressure is too tight. Impossible. Yet on the left hand side one, the top soil pressure in the first 100 mils is getting the point where that plant's struggling. So remembering what this is about, this is about the water, the, the soil sponge and water shedding and what it means to my farm and how it happens in my farm. In my, my individual situation, these are exactly the same if I go to England, if we go to South Australia, we even go to Tasmania. And I tell you what, if Andre was here, you could even get it in, New S in Queensland. Probably not right now because it's a tad moist. So what happens when we have bare soil and we've got the soil pressure like this? I want to show you something here. This is quite, this is quite unique. And that, Tom, thank you. Where did you buy that internet? Now I have to find that out later. It's online. Okay. Bare soil. What was the ambient temperature again, um, Cole? The bare soil ambient temperature at one o'clock was 25 degrees. The bare soil there is 53.9 degrees Celsius. I can absolutely guarantee you that nothing about soil biology will not survive there. It's too hot. It's far too hot. And that's at 25 degrees. Did somebody say it was 47.5 up here last in January? It got pretty warm. So at 25 degrees, it's 54 degrees. At 40, even 40 degrees, how hot's that soil going? How hot's it going to be? It, it's staggering. And yet, here we are underneath the plants, where we've got a bit of short wave radiation depletion, with long wave radiation going out that's been knocked around, and it's 29.3. So we have long. We have shortwave radiation coming down and we have it coming down and hitting this bare table. And it's going out in long wave radiation, long wave radiation multiplied by Kelvin 4. I don't, know who, I don't know who Kelvin is, but we'll meet him one day. Um, but it means that soil is re-radiating re very hot. We'll grab this pot plant. We have the shortwave radiation coming down. It's hit it and it's split. It's got shelter and it's coming out at 29 degrees, not 55 degrees or 54 degrees. That, that soil's fine, it's alive, it's got health, it's got longevity of green growth. And yeah, believe it or not, there's a paddy mill in there and it harvests about three millimetres of water per night. I've got proof of that. Um, so when we look at, at soil temperature, and ground cover. The critical thing for anybody who ever's in regenerative agriculture is to try and get a soil armour on it. Whether it's green or um, it's been allowed to lay down because of the dry conditions, it allows us to stop that re-radiated heat, um, long, one, long wave re-radiation out and kill that down from cool us down from 49, 50 not 4 degrees down to 29 degrees. Next one you, I'm, I'm sure you, you'll enjoy because this is not even half a metre apart, okay? And this is quite, okay I'll start these up and there's two videos. I'm pouring the videos in. Um, the plant on the right hand side, um, this is at um, Colin and Tom's, the water there, 500 mils goes in and it runs in at um, 23 seconds. 
We had a little bit of water shedding. Now remembering this is about the soil sponge and water shedding and conserving that 95, 90 to 95 raindrops. Can we save and store those 95 raindrops? Okay, the right hand video is finished. Nicola cut that off at a uh, couple of minutes. It was still sitting there in seven minutes time. It was going nowhere. There is no point of entry for that because there's no longevity of green growth. We have not got a soil sponge. We have 25, even we had 25 millimetres of rain. That's going to run off. We have not recharged. On the right hand side, we have stored around about 90% of that 500 mils of water we poured in, at least 90%. And we've put it down for recharge. It's that simple. Your soil's tight, it's going to go down the creek. And there's a few blokes here having a bit of a snooze, but I reckon this bloke over here is young enough to know that when he was a young fella and we had a big rain, that the water in the creeks didn't run blue, uh, muddy. They run clear. True? Don't run muddy now. They'll mud muddy now because the water runs off that fast. It hits in the river, and a creek, and it runs off, even in the river system. That's your nutrients, your topsoil, you know, and you're not getting recharge. You have no soil sponge. And if you haven't got a soil sponge, what's going to happen is that you just keep on burning, burning, and burning your carbon. You've got to get it soft. It's like a sponge. It really is. Pour water on a sponge, it will contain it. And that's exactly what this is doing. The interesting thing next is, this is, yeah, it's all my work, but this is, th these are my babies, right? On the left hand side, you have the bare soil. On the right hand side, you have the soil underneath the soil sponge. And what you have, and as Christine Jones would say, now we're calling it quorum sensing. On the left hand side, we have no quorum. On the right hand side, you can see me running around trying to find if I can find anything more. But on the right hand side, we have quorum sensing big time. Uh, he's a um, protozoa, and the guy up above's amoeba. They're critical for your soil. This soil's alive, it's healthy. It's got a quorum sensing. So we have a quorum in the right hand side. We have, we have, we've just proved that it was 150 kPa at the plant and the, what, 1500 kPa in the bare soil. So we've actually got the soil sponge. We've got it open and these things are down below saying, crikey, this is good fun. The guys out there on the 59, 49, 54 degree temperature while they're alive, trust me, they're not happy because it's bare soil and it's hot. If I asked you to lay, hop out and lay down on the ground with no clothes on for even an hour at 54 degrees, probably you're not going to be feeling very comfortable in the first 20 minutes anyway. And even if you did have your clothes on, you'd still be feeling uncomfortable. <laughs> so the message here is that biology along and you cannot and Andre is absolutely perfect correct you cannot have biology healthy biology without the exudates from the plant and the exudates are driven by many factors but also through, through mycorrhizal fungi now mycorrhizal fungi is also exactly what um, Andre was talking about but it's created by Humates actually created by a, a large percent is cre created by the glomerin from the mycorrhizal fungi. Now that, is, as um, Andre said, the water holding capacity of that is ginormous. It is seriously big. So how do we, how do we do it? Um, I was the youngest of the litter. Um, things happened pretty quick post World War II, 95 to uh, 45 to 52. There was eight kids on the deck and <laughs> it was full throttle. <laughs> and, um, and we had a large amount of fun. And uh, in post 66, that's when we started the major clearing, the Lands Department released blocks at four, four and a half thousand acres. We happened to get three because we we're right next door to it. I think we pinched about 1,500 acres that the Land Department didn't know until they turned up. <laughs> well, I didn't, Dad did, but I was with him on the old tractor. And um, so, we, we, we have an understanding what had actually happened in those days was when we cleared that new land, 
That first crop was absolutely fantastic. We knocked it down, we burnt it, we ploughed it with the old Chamberlain ploughs. Thousand acres at a time with three old Chamberlain ploughs, 18 disc ploughs, no cabins, rough as buggery and you had somebody following, fixing up flat tyres and jump, broken jumper arms. And, but it didn't alter the fact we grew 10 bags. Okay, we all put it down to potash because in five years we're back to the district average of 15 bushels. It had nothing to do with potash. For every time we ploughed it, we got rid of more biology because we couldn't get rid of all the mallee roots and we couldn't get all through the tea trees now. They were still in the ground, they were still alive. Within five years, we got rid of them all. And that's when the soil started to collapse. But Dad farmed totally different. Um, in those days, pre-chemical was a bag take of plain super. He um, had a five-year rotation and things, and we couldn't kill things. We physically could not kill whatever was growing. We could kill a fair bit of it, but we couldn't kill it all. So we still had live biology. We didn't have brown fellows. Okay, back, back to Tom's farm. Um, on the left-hand side is a three-year cover crop with Nutrisoil and three-year conventional cropping. Can anybody see the difference? What do you think? Yeah, we've got, we've got soil armour. We've got live soil, we've got longevity of green growth. As Tom said, it hasn't been very good. I understand it's been very hot because I know I've been watching how hot you guys have been getting because I was getting concerned about could I find live biology in this sort of temperature because I didn't want to bring a West Australian um, PowerPoint present across. But the point is, Tom's got on that side and the photographs before I will go back to uh, off here. On the right hand side we have conventional farming. On the left hand side we have um, the um, Nutrisol farming. And if I go back a cog, on my right side is where we took from the plants. On the left side is the dry soil biology. Okay, So I'll go back to the n next slide. Yeah, yeah, I had them back to the front, sorry. Yep. So the good biology belonged on that side this time, and the, bad bi and the sad biology on that side. I don't call it good, I don't call it bad, I call it sad. And if you spend a few thousand hours on microscopes and you keep looking at these sort of soils, it can get depressing. But every now and again you come up with a gem. Here's Tom and we were talking about how, how the land can be protected from wind shear. Okay, I reckon this is a great example of what Tom's got up there. As we're walking up to the fence line, you can see the tree line and you can see the plants getting taller as we get to the tree line. That's the wind shear. It's wind shear. The wind's ripping through that soil. It's exactly what um, Andre said. It's ripping through the soil. It's capillarizing. It's ripping out the soil and it's getting peeled away. Your whatever you thought you had contained is gone. It's as simple as that. And um, with those conditions. So I think I've got... No, I haven't. But that is a classic example of, of soil protection, how those trees are actually soil protecting those trees from the wind shear. So the wind shear is not coming down and not ripping it across. And you can actually see if Nakala was around, you could, from the end of the paddock, and Tom and Cole will verify it, from the end of the paddock up towards bloody, um, oh sorry, shouldn't be swinging, up towards um, Kmart, I think it is, you could see how the green took off because the wind was stopping the wind was stopped and it couldn't get through to the wind. The wind shear was, was actually being stopped. So um, the next slide's very interesting. I hope you enjoy this one. It's fantastic. Um, oh, crikey, there's nothing there, is there? <laughs> it's deliberate. It's trying to keep you awake. No, no, I, you know, no, you shouldn't have. Now, the, the next set of, of um, stuff we've got, I find absolutely amazing. And thank you to the Austin family. Um, crikey, you know I come from Western Australia. I've never seen anything like this. This is um, this is. You talk about soil biology. This beats soil biology any day. Check this out. Isn't that gorgeous? How's that? Um, 
David? No, uh, 1875. 1875, you look down the road. Um, the big shearing shed. I think you guys call it wool sheds over here, don't you? Wool shed. I'm getting my terminology right. You look down that line, 20 stands? 44, 44 stands. 44. 44 stands. And those sides where the, um, the pens are, you look down those posts and they look absolutely fantastic. And um, the next lot is, um, I don't know, I think I found this out in the bloody Nullarbor. I'm not sure, but oh no, it's not. <laughs> We're out in the back of the catching fans where they bring the sheep in. I know this has got nothing to do with biology, but it's about history and how we can retain history or how we can recreate it. And um, but I, I was look seriously. I want to share you with this because this is stunning, absolutely gorgeous. All right. So unfortunately, I suppose we better get back to work. Okay. Um, we're out at um, the Austins, and uh, as we were driving out there, um, what day was it, Nicola? It was th Wednesday. Tuesday. You've lost me days. If you're around the area at that time, you would have known there was a lot of dust going around, and I mean mega amounts. And as we're going out, it looked like bushfires as we were going out to the out to the property. Um, the family are, are looking at uh, regenerative ag, and like anybody else, having a tough time because of lack of moisture and all that. But there, it is something quite surprising here is that through the d difficult times that um, these plants have had, they're in pretty good fettle. They are. They're in pretty good fettle. You know, um, they've been grazed. Um, December, November, December, was it December or January they were grazed? December. And um, we just jump over to the December um, photographs, uh, and there was 50 mils on this. Do you notice any dust blowing behind us on the paddocks there? No. It's stable. Even with that amount of greenery, okay, there's a lot of uh, um, bare soil, but there's enough there to keep things cool and tie things down. So this is a photo in December. And you'd seriously believe that those native plants were seeded. They weren't, were they? Those plants weren't seeded. And we had the same in Western Australia, out at Mullerin. And, that, and seriously, Mullerin, you think you're in arid conditions, you want to go to Mullerin, it's out in the back of the Black Stump, up, on, up just under Lake Moore, heading towards the Gold Country, up the lake, up to Kew, Big Bell, um, Mekathara, you know edge of the station country. It's truly amazing and this here is identical to what we have got over there. Where the air seed has been, you can see the lines. Next thing is um, what's going on here? Have we, have we got biology? Have we, help, have we got water holding capacity? Have we got the soil sponge? Now, and have we got less water shedding. Because as things change, we've got to start storing our water. Exactly what Andre said. But these are physicals. These are, these are classed as um, non-evidence in uh, the statistical world until you meet my superiors. You know, and, oh, not superiors, so I guess they're equal, but um, people have been communicating this for years. And Charlie and Christine and bloody, um, the old bush ranger coal, uh, and they were fascinated. And, um, and I know Nicola was, um, that she even pinched my glory a bit when, oh, but we've already done that, David said. <laughs> so th this next one is water infiltration again. And the same thing, the soil pressures were high on the bare soil. Um, this side's going in a bit quicker because David said it was going into the ground, uh, found a crack. But have a look at this water as we pour this water in. This plant's accepting the water. It's going straight through the plant. And you actually look into the middle of the plant, you'll start to see clearer raindrops. Those raindrops, that, that water we're pouring in is now getting filtered and it's changing back into clear water. It's not pulling. That plant, I'm going to run that again because that's so important. That um, Okay. Thank you, um, David. That was a bit remiss. So 
On the side we put 500 mils and there was a little bit of crack in there. We poured this first lot of water in and you can see it start to charge straight through. That's going straight into your sponge, it's going straight down and it's actually recharging you. And it's, being held, it's going to hold, be hold there for a long time for the longevity of your green growth. If an, even if it only takes us, takes us out an extra 20 days to get that next rainfall event to help it, it's critical. But it's also cri critical to your livestock and the future of your soil because your soil needs these plants to live. Soil is alive and it's not dirt. Dirt's on your hands. You wash it off. Dirt's dead. So if you've got dirt, I reckon you're in a bit of bother. But if you've got soil that's a little sad, then yes, we can fix it. And we can help you. It's quite easy. And no, you are not going to go broke because these processes are not that difficult and it's within your grasp to do. What we're going to do is jump onto this ne next set of slides and on the left hand side is the biology from underneath um, that plant we were looking at. I told you there's nothing wrong with my eyes. So that's the biology underneath that plant. What we did was um, we took out um, a clump of soil and you, you get a, after you do a few thousand you don't really need to worry about measuring them. It, rough enough is good enough but you're pretty close because you know you've done a few thousand so you just put a bit of soil in there and um, 10 to 1, 10 of soil, 1 of soil, 10 to water, 30 shakes, whack her under the microscope and uh, that's what you've got. This soil is highly active, but it's also bacteria dominant, which I have no problem with at this stage. But as, and it's only because of the dry that this soil is bacteria dominant. You do not really want bacteria dominant soil either. And we'll have a look at this again in the winter or when things are really turning along. Um, we'll find the cellulites and we'll find some, God forbid, those horrible things called nematodes. But they kill everything. Frankly, there's four or five naughty nematodes and 36 good guys and half of those sods eat the other blokes. So why are you killing them? The other thing with um, going, uh, going forward, I'm just going to go back a couple because there's something here that I, I, I'd like to address. Within this, um, the, the three-year conventional soil, why pathogens come into soil is because we're allowed them and it's like exactly like your pesky naughty weeds your melons i don't know if you've got flea bane over here or nightshade but i definitely know you get melons and, and you know all these plants that grow during the summer are doing one thing and one thing only they are trying to protect the soil the soil wants to live and they're trying to create an armor they're only growing there because they're opportunistic plants and we gave them the space to be there. If we hadn't given them the space to be there, they wouldn't be there. But we've given them the space, and I guarantee you, as your nitrates drop out, these plants will drop out, and your annuals, your perennials will come back, because they're nitrate-driven. Calthrop, uh, I noticed calthrop here. Uh, you don't call it calthrop, you call it the horny thing. Uh, uh, sorry? They grow in summer. And people go and spray them. Yeah, okay, why, why are you spraying them? As soon as a cat head pops up, it's got its first seed sitting in the middle of it. And it grows vines, it's like a paddy melon or a melon. It grows out across the paddock, uh, and you come along and spray it. The vine's there. But it's going to go into senescence before you start seeding anyway. So why are you, why are you wasting $25 a gallon and Esther and, and bloody Roundup and all the rest of the stuff that goes with it? Plus being bored to death on a tractor or a boom spray, killing something this is going to go into senescence anyway, and it's doing you good. Preferably, I wouldn't rather them not being there, but there's an opportunity when you change your thought process, your management will change, the nitrates will start disappearing, and I absolutely guarantee you that your cat's heads will go. So, so that was pretty critical to think that we, we're allowing, and this goes along with pathogens, as well. We're, we're allowing within this, within this system of conventional farming, we're allowing the pathogens to take control of us, our bank and our plants because they have no mycorrhizal connection. There is no soil sponge. They are living in solution. 
they have got no defence mechanism. They will go into wilt, I absolutely guarantee you, they will go into permanent wilting point four weeks before those other plants will. Four weeks, that plant's dead. Four weeks later, these guys are still roaring along. Okay, they're struggling, they're thirsty, but they're hanging on because it's called the longevity of green growth and it was created by our soil sponge. It had no or very little water shedding. We were grabbing hold of 95 grain drops or 90 rain drops and we were storing them. This is at Austin's and I, I think take some time over this and have a look. Look at the organic matter increase. Does anybody pick up from what um, Andre said this morning about the increase in organic matter? Did anybody pick up the fact that it might be able to hold more water? How much more water? Nicola, how much more water is that going to hold? Yeah, divide that by 1.76 and it'll come back to, to carbon. So, you know, he, he's still got a, a really... A, a, He's, a, he's up to just about a megalitre of water we can store with these plants. We'll get Alistair to comment on these for us, please. Thanks, Alistair. Um, the only phosphorus we put on was about 50 kilograms to the hectare of guano under a crop. How much P was that? Uh, it's about 12%, so six units. Yeah, fine. You're not, certainly not over to cooking for the mycorrhizal fungi. Um, mycorrhizal fungi, you've got to add a large amount of phosphorus to knock the mycorrhizae around. So that's, all, uh, that's all out of the same paddock, um, all those different soil types. Um, and we pretty much put a uh, liquid blend of compost extract, uh, worm juice, and I think that year we put a few trace elements in as well. Um, and then just the guano um, as, you, as our solar fertiliser. Um, and just a foliar of the, pretty much the same mix, about six weeks, well, not for six weeks after the crop comes up. And I uh, don't think we did a second foliar that year. 120% increase in phosphorus, 122% increase in phosphorus, and a 292% increase in phosphorus. Uh, and this is what Andre was showing us this morning, these massive increases to doubt putting the inputs on. So it's available P. So, you know, when we say um, that we've got P in the bank because we've put a couple of bags an acre of, um, or heck, there's a fertiliser on, and we've got um, phosphorus in the bank, we've got um, lime in the bank. Well, it's in the bank. It's a bit like any investment. You're not going to get much out of it, I can guarantee you. Not in my lifetime, because it's going to sit there. It's not available. This, this photograph here is, um, if you look up on the top of the plant, you'll see a, 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 like a group of soil and the little wires, two little wires running up and holding them up. That's hyphae. That's your soil glue. That's the thing that's creating it, okay? If I jump across to the next one, this is a cute little guy. He's gorgeous. Uh, he's, a, he's a flagellate. He's spinning around. He actually has got a little whip. And if he would stay still enough, you could actually see his whip. But trying to catch up with this guy at 800 degree, 800 mag, is just about impossible. Because <laughs> if, 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 yeah, there you go. You're trying to catch up with him. You seriously can't. You, you can't focus. You can't get a quick enough focus on him. Sometimes you, you keep annoying him long enough, he'll puff out a steam and you'll be able to actually watch him. You know, and you can see his little whip running around. Then you put him back in the ground so you don't feel horrible about it. <laughs> Oh, that's, uh, that's another one. Um, on, the, on the bottom left hand side, we have uh, the bottom uh, brown thing is a root hair. And up, up above that, you'll see some wires running off it. That's at 400. And on the left hand side, that's the same thing, a little blue dot in there. And it's got a, a hair in there. It looks about that wide underneath the microscope. And there's 28 strands of mycorrhizal fungi running along that um, root. And that root would have been less than a pinhead. Within the soil, within a healthy soil, in really healthy uh, biological soil, that's um, bio really cranking, there's 25,000 kilometres of mycorrhizal fungi in that soil. 
in that cubic meter. 25,000 kilometers. Now, I didn't measure that, uh, and I'm not about to, but I'm going to go to the next one, and you can probably, because that is less, that shot that you're looking at there is seriously would be less than 0.2 of a micron you're looking at. So there's a huge amount of stuff in there that um, at that space. I, I think this is special. I don't know if it's going to come up that well um, because of the light. Um, let me just have a look. Yeah, that's coming up. See the, see the root hair coming down like that? It's the, that part of the root coming on, and then that yellow thing coming down. And see all those fibres running right down to the bottom? That's hyphae running down because there's something there that that hyphae is interested in. This is well aggregated soil, it's got a beautiful soil sponge, and it absolutely guarantee you holds on to your moisture and recharges. This is again, we're looking at uh, aggregated soil, that's it, quite frankly, I, I, didn't, I can actually bet on that. That's um, Briggs's just by the shape of it and the lines that we saw a minute ago. Uh, how do I know? Because you'll see them all over the joint. Highly aggregated soil. Now you're going to meet a few of my friends. This friend here is, is a, is a uh, bacteria-eating nematode. Um, he's gorgeous, he, he or she, or he, he, um, they are very placid under the scope. Um, the naughty ones, they absolutely hate the light. They absolutely go bonkers and they're really hard work to catch these guys. This next, next guy, is he's absolutely gorgeous. He's one of my favourites, the cellular, and if you have a real close look on around his body, you'll get the little little paddles. And this is actually a video, and uh, it's remiss of me, but if you turn the video on, he's having a snooze, or she's having a snooze, and everything inside there is bacteria, and some of them are still wiggling <laughs> because he's just, they've just been consumed. So it was really quite, um, quite amazing, my, my journey through my microscopes, and and when we, you've all seen this, yep. Um, oh, bloody hell, hang on. Sorry folks, I've got a bit of a problem here. Mick! Mick, what do you want? What? Is that right? Crikey Mick. All right, well look, I tell you what, I'm here and I'm gonna show you what we talked about. now. You don't mind me if I tell these blokes, these um, ladies and gentlemen, we got into a bit of mischief that night, and yeah, we did blow the froth off a couple. Yeah, mate. Yeah, we were talking braille. That's no... Yeah, mate, we're definitely talking braille by the time we finished. That was fine. But what we come up with is this photo, and you know it's called size, the old bush rangers. But that's what we're aiming for. And that's exactly what Mick's looking for. Because Mick's thought about it. His thought process is going to change his management and it's going to help him into the future to manage and, as, and to be within... I can't talk with these. I've got to walk around. Um, these guys, within, within regenerative agriculture, there's so many aspects, but the only real major thing that you, to be is you must have soil cover. You must try and maintain green growth and you cereal growers, I totally understand what you're talking about. I'm taking your moisture away. Well, hang on. I, I've got some proof that we are definitely harvesting moisture with your melons, especially your summer active plants. Most, a lot of them are actually using, uh, storing their own moisture because they, they were designed to do it. They were designed to grow in summer without the reliance on rain. They had to cart their own, they harvest their own. Now I'm going to leave you with this. I, uh, uh, this guy of mine, he's a mate of mine, and I, I love his quote. He, um, I, I'll put it up and you read it and you think, say, th say what you think, but I like it. To th those of you who can't see it, science is an evolution itself. You have to look at nature to understand the truth of all things. And my mate was named Albert Einstein. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>